Here is Edward Bear, coming downstairs now. Bump, bump, bump on the back of his head, behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs. But sometimes he feels that there really is another way, if only he could stop bumping for a moment and think of it. And then he feels that, perhaps, there isn't. Anyhow, here he is, at the bottom, and ready to be introduced to you, Winnie the Pooh. Those words, penned by A. A. Milne in 1926, introduced the world to a most beloved bear. Winnie the Pooh has stayed a staple of story and later animation for generations now. There's a good chance your grandparents, or at least your parents, grew up loving this bear. The adventures, the unexpected stoic wisdom, and the friendships of this lovable, silly old bear can really hit our nostalgic sweet spots. Winnie the Pooh was a creation of A. A. Milne, inspired by his son, Christopher Robin Milne, and his toy bear. But there's so much more to the story than that. It's hard to know just how much our individual choices and actions can affect the world. Sometimes it's easy to think we haven't had much of an impact at all, because we can't always see it. But even the smallest decisions we make can have far-reaching effects and create inspiration in ways we never imagined. In 1914, a Canadian soldier was on his way to Quebec, getting ready to join his regiment before they left to fight in France. At a train station in White River, Ontario, this young man met a bear cub, a real black bear cub, and he named her Winnie. This is the story of the real Winnie the Pooh and the lives of those who inspired some of our most cherished childhood stories. I'm your host, Kristen Robine Terpstra, and this is the History Cache. Let's have a look inside. In 1914, the 27-year-old Harry Colburn left home, along with millions of others, to fight in World War I. Harry had been born in Birmingham, England, in 1887. At 18, he emigrated to Canada with dreams of becoming a veterinarian. He first settled in Toronto, where he attended the Ontario Veterinary College, graduating in 1911 as a veterinary surgeon. After that, he moved to Winnipeg and found a job with Manitoba's Department of Agriculture. He became an officer in the Fort Garry Horse Cavalry Regiment, and in 1914, his regiment was among the first in Canada to enlist. Harry had to travel from Winnipeg to Valcartier, Quebec, to meet his troop. That's a huge journey. Clocking in at well over 1,500 miles, or over 2,500 kilometers, even today that trip would take over two days by train. Gorgeous scenery, though. Harry's train stopped in White River, Ontario, and that's where he saw and fell in love with a bear. She was just a cub, a small black bear. Her mother had been shot by a hunter, the same one who would sell her to Harry. He scooped up the cub into his arms and paid the hunter $20, which, according to the CBC, would be around $429 today. So, no small chunk of change. He named her Winnipeg Bear after his hometown and called her Winnie for short. When Harry finally met his regiment, the other soldiers quickly became enamored with the lovable bear, making her the mascot of the 2nd Canadian Infantry Brigade and playing with her and giving her treats when they had any downtime. They'd feed her apples, a sweet mixture of condensed milk and corn syrup, took photos with her, laughed as she climbed tent poles, and enjoyed watching her follow Harry around as if she were his shadow. At night, she would curl up under his cot to sleep. When Harry left for England to train for the front, he took Winnie with him. There is an incredibly rich history of animal mascots in World War I. There were bears, goats, pigeons, dogs, horses, you name it, all on the front. 
Two of the most notable animal mascots have been covered on this podcast. Stubby, the most decorated dog in American history, and Sergeant Bill, the heroic goat who reportedly saved the lives of three soldiers on the battlefield. Both of them survived the war and returned home heroes. If you're interested in hearing their stories, you can find Sergeant Bill's story in the episode A Heroic Goat, An Angry Cat, and a Graveyard Full of Daredevils, and Stubby's story in the episode titled Irina Sendler, The Titanic Engineers, Invisible Hands, and Stubby the War Dog. That was back when I used to cram a bunch of stories into one episode. Luckily for Winnie, she would not have to endure the hardship and trauma of battle. Harry was told that when he shipped out to France, he could not bring Winnie with him. So he loaned her to the London Zoo, where he knew she would be cared for until they could both return home. Harry served as a veterinarian throughout the war, tending to the animals, mostly horses, that were serving alongside the soldiers. He would fight through all four years of the war and miraculously survive. Whenever he received leave from the front, he would go and visit Winnie at the zoo before heading back out into the bloody fray. In the meantime, Winnie seemed to be enjoying her new home at the zoo. She grew from a cub into a healthy adult bear, though she never lost her cub-like tenderness. She was incredibly tame and possessed an astonishingly gentle temperament, so much so that, according to Lindsay Maddock, Harry's great-granddaughter, who wrote a book about the story called Finding Winnie, the zoo would even let children into Winnie's enclosure to play with her. That's not something that would happen today, and for good reason, but that showcases how docile Winnie truly was. The war finally ended in 1918. By the time Harry, now a captain, returned from the front, Winnie was a star. She had become hugely popular with zoo guests, especially children, and Harry realized she'd found a better home at the London Zoo than any he could give her back home in Canada. So Harry permanently donated Winnie to the zoo, which couldn't have been an easy decision, but it was in the best interest of Winnie. In London, Winnie continued to grow in popularity, attracting many regular visitors and fans. One of those admirers was a small boy. His name was Christopher Robin Milne. He was the son of World War I veteran and writer A.A. A. Milne. Christopher was such a fan of Winnie's that he changed the name of his favorite stuffed bear from Edward to Winnie. He added on the name Pooh after a swan he met while he was on vacation giving us all the name Winnie the Pooh. Christopher Robin Milne and that stuffed bear would become the inspiration for one of the world's most renowned children's book characters. As for Harry, before he returned to Canada, he completed postgraduate work at the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons in London. He made his way back home in 1920 and opened a small animal hospital in Winnipeg. He married, had a son, and lived out his remaining years tending to the animals he loved so much, until his death in 1947. As for Winnie, she had a long, happy life. When she passed away at 20 years old in 1934, her story made news around the world. Today, at the London Zoo, if you walk near the Butterfly Paradise and the War Memorial, you can see a bronze statue of Harry and Winnie together. She, in bronzed as a cub, is standing on her hind legs and holding the hands of Harry, dressed in uniform, the veterinarian and soldier that changed her life. Neither of them could have known how much of an impact they would have on the rest of us. The ripple effect of a young man at a train stop in a small Canadian town caring for a bear cub had such far-reaching effects that over a century later, we still celebrate the story they inspired. In the book The House on Pooh Corner, A.A. A. Milne wrote something that fits just right when thinking about Harry and Winnie. In the story, Christopher Robin is talking to Winnie, asking him to remember him always. These books are now under the public domain, so this time I can actually read to you what I mean. Here it is. Pooh, promise you won't forget about me, ever, not even when I'm a hundred. Pooh thought for a little bit. How old shall I be then? 99. Pooh nodded. I promise, he said. 
Still, with his eyes on the world, Christopher Robin put out a hand and felt for Pooh's paw. Pooh, said Christopher Robin earnestly, if I, if I'm not quite... He stopped and tried again. Pooh, whatever happens, you will understand, won't you? Understand what? Oh, nothing. He laughed and jumped to his feet. Come on. Where, said Pooh. Anywhere, said Christopher Robin. So they went off together. But wherever they go, and whatever happens to them on the way, in that enchanted place on the top of the forest, a little boy and his bear will always be playing. wrote Winnie the Pooh in 1926, and a sequel, The House on Pooh Corner, in 1928. There was also a poem Milne wrote about Winnie in the children's book called When We Were Very Young in 1924, and 11 more in the children's book titled Now We Are Six in 1927. The stories we have of Winnie the Pooh are comforting, charming, and its characters adorably delightful. The life of their author was less heartwarming, and the effects the book's success had on his son Christopher Robin Milne were calamitous. Alan Alexander Milne was born in London in 1882. His father was the headmaster of Henley House, a private school which Milne himself would attend. One of his teachers was a young H.G. Wells, noted author of many notable works, including War of the Worlds. Milne went on to study at Trinity College, Cambridge, on a mathematics scholarship. While there, he began to find his love for the written word, editing and writing for Granta, a student magazine. After graduating, Milne traded in numbers for words, moved back to London, and started a writing career with the literary magazine Punch. He wrote humorous poems and essays. In 1913, he married Dorothy de Selincourt, who went by the name Daphne. Milne continued to work for the magazine for 11 years, all the way through 1914, when his life, like so many others, was upended by World War I. Milne was a pacifist, but still enlisted in 1915. He began his military career with the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, then the Royal Corps of Signals. While at war, Milne wrote his first play, a one-act comedy called Wurzel Flummery. He would go on to write quite a few plays, including an adaptation of The Wind in the Willows, titled Toad at Toad Hall. During the war, Milne saw action, including the Battle of the Somme, which, according to the UK's National Army Museum, was the British Army's bloodiest battle of all time, with over 57,000 casualties sustained on the first day alone. The Sum Offensive would last from July 1st, 1916 to November 18th, 1916. According to Britannica, British losses amounted to 420,000, French losses to 194,000, and German losses of 440,000. It was a brutal battle. But Milne survived, as did E.H. Shepard, the artist who would go on to illustrate Winnie the Pooh. Milne grew ill during the war with a bad case of trench fever, a sickness that, according to the University of Kansas, we now know was transmitted via lice, a common problem in the trenches. Milne's illness made him unfit for the front, but his talent for writing made him a valuable acquisition for MI7B. This was a British propaganda unit whose job was to bolster support for the war. Milne, now an even more ardent pacifist, was assigned to the unit in 1916. After the war, Punch magazine didn't rehire him, so he got to work writing more plays, many of which were well-received. He also wrote a rather popular detective novel called The Red House Mystery. On August 1st, 1920, Milne's first and only child was born, a son named Christopher Robin Milne. For his first birthday, Christopher was given the stuffed bear that would help ignite a sensation not even his father could have predicted. 
1924, Milne wrote a series of children's poems called When We Were Very Young, where we first see the character Winnie the Pooh, followed by the first full volume about him and Christopher Robin in 1926. In the Hundred Acre Wood, Milne designed a world far from the sum, a peaceful sanctuary free from the horrors he experienced in the war. Despite his undeniable talent at writing children's poems and stories, Milne was not an interested father. He didn't particularly like children, once telling an interviewer, quote, I am not inordinately fond of children. I have certainly never felt in the least sentimental about them, or no more than one becomes for a moment over a puppy or a kitten, unquote. Christopher Robin Milne described his father as absent, he would sequester himself away in his office, preferring to spend time with the imaginary Christopher Robin rather than the real one. Milne would learn of how and what his son was doing mainly from the nanny and his wife. He would then use what they told him as inspiration for his books. Christopher later said, quote, It was my mother who used to come and play in the nursery with me and tell him about the things I thought and did. It was she who provided most of the material for my father's books." Unquote. Christopher was seven years old when he found himself thrust into the international sensation that was Winnie the Pooh. He had to pose for pictures with his stuffed animals, the ones Milne based his characters on, and sing songs from his father's books for audiences. He even voiced the character of Christopher Robin for the audiobooks. At first, Christopher enjoyed the notoriety. That was until he turned nine years old and was sent off to boarding school. At school, Christopher was bullied relentlessly. The other students would yell at him, Where's your teddy bear? The constant teasing went on for years, and the bullying would often get physical. By the age of 13, Christopher was taking boxing lessons so he could learn how to defend himself. The relationship between Christopher and his parents would exponentially sour as he grew older. Christopher later wrote a series of memoirs showcasing his troubled childhood. In adulthood, the notoriety didn't get any easier as he was constantly being given books to sign and attention he didn't want, all of it reminding him of how much pain the name Christopher Robin had given him. Over the years, his resentment towards his parents grew. He wrote, Quote, in pessimistic moments, when I was trudging London in search of an employer wanting to make use of such talents as I could offer, it seemed to me almost that my father had got to where he was by climbing upon my infant shoulders, that he had filched from me my good name and had left me with nothing but the empty fame of being his son. Unquote. Christopher refused to profit from the Winnie the Pooh stories, refusing royalties for years, even when times were hard, which they so often were. In his early adulthood, he scraped together a living, doing whatever odd jobs he could find. Long before this time, A. A. Milne had given up writing children's stories, devoting his time to plays, novels, and short stories. Milne was aware that his son was suffering from his notoriety and said, quote, I feel that the legal Christopher Robin has already had more publicity than I want for him. I do not want C.R. Milne to ever wish that his name were Charles Robert. A.A. A. Milne resented being typecast as a children's writer. For the rest of his life, no matter what he wrote, all of it would be overshadowed by his books on Winnie the Pooh. None of his other works would ever come close to gaining the same level of notoriety a notoriety that continued to fissure Christopher's relationship with both his parents. After Christopher gave an interview detailing the neglect he experienced in childhood, the rift between them grew even further. His mother was so angry with his speaking out that she had a statue of him torn down and buried so she wouldn't have to look at him. In 1939, A.A. A. Milne wrote his autobiography titled, It's Too Late Now. That same year, 1939, Christopher dropped out of Cambridge to join the fight in World War II. His father, a World War I vet, would also re-enlist. Christopher was wounded with shrapnel in Italy in 1944, but he recovered and served for the remainder of the war. 
Afterwards, he re-enrolled in Trinity College, Cambridge, and graduated with a degree in English. In 1948, he did something that would cement the rift between himself and his parents. Marriage. He married Leslie de Selincourt, who was his first cousin. She was the daughter of his mother's brother, and the family very much disproved of the union. The couple would have one child, a daughter named Claire, who, due to the fact her parents were so closely related, was born with severe cerebral palsy, as well as several other issues. She would be confined to a wheelchair her entire life. At this point, Christopher decided to accept his portion of the royalties. He would eventually sell half of his shares, and use the other half to set up a fund for his daughter, who, according to the New York Times, received $735,000 a year by the time she was in her 40s, followed by a single payout of $44 million later. In 1947, the stuffed animals who helped inspire the stories went on tour. That was Winnie the Bear, Piglet, Kanga, and Eeyore. By then, Little Roo had unfortunately been lost somewhere in an apple orchard. Owl and Rabbit are not on display, as they were created only for the books and weren't based on any of Christopher's toys. As the years passed by, Christopher rarely saw his father, and never saw his mother, who still harbored resentment for him. In 1952, A.A. Milne suffered a stroke. He would survive four more years until he passed away at his home in Sussex in 1956, just two weeks after his 74th birthday. His wife would survive him for 15 more years. When she was on her deathbed, Christopher wanted to visit her. It would have been the first time in many years the two had been in the same room together. But she refused to see him. Christopher opened a bookstore, Harbor Bookshop, in Dartmouth, finding success in the business, even though he still had his father's books thrust into his hands for autographs. Christopher would politely oblige and ask that, in return, a donation be made to his favorite charity, Save the Children. In 1974, he began to publish his memoirs, first The Enchanted Places, followed by two other books, The Path Through the Trees in 1979 and The Hollow on the Hill in 1982. It was in these books Christopher truly broke the silence on his relationship with his parents and the effects his father's books had on him. In 1987, 40 years after his father had given his stuffed animals to the publisher E.P. Dutton, Dutton offered Christopher a chance to take them back. He refused them, and that same year they were donated to the New York Public Library, where they remain on display to this day. In his later years, Christopher was able to develop peace with the chaos he had experienced when he was younger, saying of all of it, quote, It's been something of a love-hate relationship but it's okay now. In 1981, Christopher made his way back to the London Zoo, where he first fell in love with the real Winnie. He unveiled the zoo's second bronze statue of her, which you can still visit today. Christopher survived to age 75, passing away in his sleep in a Devon hospital in 1996. His and his father's legacy are complicated, the success of Winnie the Pooh brought them both heartbreak in many ways, but it also gave joy and comfort to millions of children. And a century later, those stories still endure. Stories inspired by a young boy and his stuffed toys. The need for a writer to forget the battlefield and find solace in the hundred-acre wood. And a Canadian soldier at a train stop who showed kindness to one real silly old bear. All of them came together to remind us that, quote, you are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. Thank you so much for listening to the show today. I hope you enjoyed hearing about the true story of Winnie the Pooh. I have to admit, this one really got to me but I've come to learn that the best episodes are the ones that get me teary-eyed at least once. If you like the show, please consider rating and following on iTunes or wherever you listen. 
This really does help make the show more visible out of the ocean of podcasts floating around out there. I'll be back again in three weeks with more history for you. Until then, if you'd like to get a hold of me, you can email me at historycashpodcast at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram. If you'd like to help support the show, you can check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash historycashpodcast. You can also make a one-time donation. You can access the link for that on the website under the support tab. That website is historycashpodcast.podbean.com. Background music is licensed through Envato Elements, theme song through Audio Jungle. Stay safe, stay smart, stay curious. And until we meet again, my dear friends, go make some history.